before I kick you to the official intro, I do just want to let you guys know that I think this is the first video you're going to be seeing in a series of vlogs. And these vlogs are all designed to help me read down my TBR because that is the goal for this year, Backlist 2024. And uh, this I think is the first one. So I just wanted to let you know that it's gonna be a series of vlogs with different themes and different angles and different ways for me to find books to read for my own TBR. Uh, but this is the first one, so enjoy that. Oh, hello. Today we are starting on a project that I did for the first time last year and was such a rousing success that I simply had to do it again this year. And that is reading recommendations from other booktubers based on their end of the year favorites list with the caveat that it's a book I already owned or was like actively about to get. So I have an entire list of books that I was influenced to be interested in from people's end of the year lists. But this is purely just like self-selection as I've been watching all the lists, which by the way, I am a rampant, avid consumer of. If you made an end of the year list and it has one view, it was mine. If it has no views, I didn't find it. Like, I love them. This time of year, YouTube just feeds them to me like candy, the algorithm knows. So um, I've watched a bunch of them and uh, I had 10, two of which I don't have in physical form, but I had as eBooks. So I might include those, but I already have eight in physical form and I kind of feel like that's enough. So let's talk about, well, hmm, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna go ahead and tell you who these books are inspired by. You know what might be fun? Okay, I'm gonna show you these books now and I'm not gonna tell you the booktuber from whose list I got it. And in the comments, as you see them, if you have a guess, as to who influenced me, put it in the comments. And I will tell you there's a couple of these that multiple people co-signed on. So that'll be kind of fun, right? Okay, so we've got a nice melange of subgenres, and let's just get into it. So first of all, a controversial book, Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. I was kind of on the fence of if I was gonna read this. And what I'm excited about on this one is that this was on people's best of the year and worst of the year. So I have no idea where I'm gonna fall and I'm excited to find out. So this is literary fiction. I believe it is about a woman who has a student or like a somebody in like a writing group with her who dies maybe and she takes the manuscript and passes it off as her own but she's a white lady and this other person was Asian so like meta-ness about publishing and race and I'm very curious to see what I think of this book. Then we have Sign Here by Claudia Lux. I will say this is a co-worker of mine. This is one of her favorite books of 2022 and I don't even remember what this is about. I just got it because she was raving about it. I think it's sort of like campy or lighthearted horror mystery, something about a devil, like selling your soul or something. I don't know. But it seems light and fun and I saw it on a list and so I pulled it. One I've been trying to get to for a while, which is Sword Heart by T. Kingfisher. You guys know I love T. Kingfisher and this is a continuation of the World of the White Rat. The first ones in this are Clockwork, Boy, blah, blah, Clockwork Boys and The Wonder Engine, which I absolutely loved last year. So yeah, I think that this is kind of a standalone-ish, but it's in that world. And then from here, you start getting all the Paladin novels of which there are currently four. So very excited to continue on. It's a fantasy with a strong romantic element, I believe. And I'm very excited on this one. Then Jade Legacy. So this is one that is a continuation or it's the finale of a trilogy. I have read the first two books and this was on a best of the year list. So it's time for me to try it. I will say you guys may have seen already that I did not get on very well with Jade War. So I gave Jade City, the first book, a four star. I gave Jade War, the middle book, a three star. And I don't know what I'm gonna do with this because I noticed something about the writing in Jade War that started driving me crazy. <sighs> So we'll see, but I have this, I need to read it. And so many people have loved this. Like this was on one person's list in particular, which is why I pulled it. But in general, people love this trilogy and really love this book. 
I've seen all the memes of people crying reading it. So I'm trying to go in with neutral expectations after having been very disappointed, been very disappointed by the second book. So, but this was, everybody loves this, including the person who put it on their list. So let's send me some good vibes. Based on what I've told you, what do you think is gonna happen with this book? Do you think this is gonna surprise me? Do you think I'm gonna hate it? Do you think I'm gonna be neutral on it? Let's guess right now. Okay, and then Leech by Huron Inez. I believe that this is some kind of horror with a isolation element. If I'm remembering rightly, you guys told me about this one in chat one night during a live stream and I was like, ooh, okay, let me check this out. And this was on someone's list, so it made my little roundup of books and I have very high hopes for this one. I've heard the writing is very distinctive, but I'm down for that. It has a lot of elements that I really like, so I'm very hopeful this is gonna be a big hit. Very big shift in tone. Uh, the Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes by Kat Sebastian. I have been on the lookout for a book to um, get back or to try Kat Sebastian again as a seasoned romance reader. I tried one of their books at the very beginning of my romance reading journey. This was back when I was still an evangelical, so I think I just couldn't fully get on board with the non-straight elements. Yes, we all live and learn. I'm now fully on board for that. In fact, these are two bisexuals doing crime. So this sounds great. And yeah, so I'm excited for this historical romance and I'm excited to see my opinions about Kat Sebastian as a very different person and also uh, having read a lot more romance. So also the cats have zoomies if you can hear that. Um, okay, what else do I have? Going from the piles. Oh yeah, okay, Slewfoot by Braum. This is another horror-ish kind of thing. Actually, I just realized there's several horror things in here. And this was another really hot book in 2022 that I just haven't gotten to yet, but it was on, somebody read it in 2023 and put it on their best of the year list. And it's been staring at me from my shelves for quite some time. So I feel like the moment has come and I believe, are there illustrations in this? Maybe a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I'm very excited to see what I think of this and I'm hoping I'm really going to love it. And I believe that this author has a couple of other sort of like fairy-ish, fairy tale retelling-ish, but dark and horror. And I'm hoping I'm going to like this and that I'm going to want to pick up those other ones. And then finally, this one is probably like the most out of what I would typically read, but I heard so many people talking about this kind of in a polarized way, but I did see it on a best of, um, or actually a couple. Uh, and that is Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit. I think that this is a more intense version of horror than I would normally go for, but um, I've heard it pitched as an amazing haunted house story. And it's also by a trans woman. And I think the haunted house is some sort of metaphor for the trans experience. So thematically that works for me. Trope wise, this works for me. So I'm hoping that I can get on with like darker flavor of horror than I tend to gravitate to. I often enjoy like either campy horror or mystery horror. So let's see how I do with this. Okay, so in the comments, put who you think recommended these to me or who I took the recommendation from. And if you've got any predictions about how I'm gonna do. Woodheart by T. Kingfisher. <laughs> <laughs> this is an adult fantasy romance about a woman named Hala, who, after losing her husband, also inherits the estate of her great uncle. And along with that inheritance comes a number of problems, including her relatives who are chomping at the bit to take it away from her. One of the things that she has inherited is an enchanted sword. There is an immortal being trapped within the sword. And when Hala draws the sword, he is then sworn to protect her. And they go on this journey together to help Hala try and preserve her estate and survive her relatives. This is a pretty plot light, low stakes sort of fantasy romance. I would even call this cozy. And I have an issue or I've had an issue with a lot of the cozy fantasies that I've read in the past. I found that Sword Heart did a really excellent job giving the characters high stakes that didn't feel super stressful for us, the readers. Like Hollow was very interested in all of these things that she had to do with her relatives and her inheritance and all of that but it still played in a way that was cozy enough for the reader. I've also well, I accidentally finished a book without checking in, so I apologize. <laughs> That was my intent, was to talk to you guys as I went, but Sword Heart was just so delightful. I just read it straight through. 
I love this entire series so far. So this is in the same world as the Clockwork Boys series and it's a standalone but it's within that overall world. So there's the two Clockwork Boys books, and then there are four, so far, Paladins books after this. Though, based on how this ends, I really hope we get some resolution. So, fingers crossed. This was so wonderful. So, Hala is a widow who's been taking care of her dead husband's great uncle as his housekeeper, and he leaves all of his estate to her when she dies. The rest of the family are absolutely horrible and they try to like lock her up and force her to marry one of the cousins. And so she decides she's going to herself uh, rather than marry him so that her estate can pass to her nieces who are, you know, farmers and could really use the money. But when she goes to do that, the sword she unsheathes in her room is a magic sword and it has a man that comes out of it and he is now her bodyguard, basically. So this is the story of them going to the Temple of the White Rat because they are known to have like like these scholars who can help settle these disputes. So there's, it's like a road trip story. They're going to the temple and it's like their adventures along the way and back, trying to get her inheritance back and falling in love. Oh my gosh, Hala and Sar Sarkis are just so sweet. I love them. Like, it was just so wonderful. <laughs> they had great banter and great chemistry and both, I mean, he's obviously older. He's like a 500 year old magical sword man, but she's also, in her mid-30s, which in ye fantasy world is like middle-aged. So like it was nicer that it was sort of an older people romance. We don't get those all the time. Yeah, it's not super explicit, but it's definitely a romance and really wonderful and I loved it. I do think it was too long. The pacing I think was a little off, but um, there were some great side characters. I loved Zale, who's the priest who comes with them. Yeah, they were great. And I don't know, I just love this so much. Can I just say that Mari, last time I did this video, I picked either two or three books from her and two of them were four and a half stars. And I'm also gonna give this a four and a half star. So I think what I'm learning is that when we are both interested in the same book, it goes very, very well. So if you have not started reading in this World of the White Rat series from T. Kingfisher, I highly recommend it. The world is really fun and interesting and she just, I love her writing so much. So yeah, great way to start this off. I did read this brick um, because it was on my priorities for the year. What an ending. Greenbone Saga Man. My, I think when in the um, priorities vlog where I also had a clip about this, my, it, my complaint, if any, is that because this spans so many years to wrap up the story, that there is a bit of like time skipping that is kind of takes you out of the flow a bit and doesn't really allow you to kind of like linger on some of the more dramatic moments because we have to move on to the next time skip. Um, it wasn't, I still gave it five stars. Um, so pacing is like really the only complaint that I had about it. And for something that had to cover so very much, I think it still did a pretty good job. So yeah, The Greenbelt Saga, one of my favorite series now, and I probably will reread it. It is still so unique, so different from everything else out there. Jade. Jade Legacy, I'm like 50-ish pages in. I should say, okay, it's better. The thing I noticed isn't bothering me as much so far with the writing, so that's good. And I'm hopeful it's gonna get, it's just gonna continue to get better and the plot will stay good enough that I can like not focus on that. But am I like kicking my heels in delight in the same way? No. <laughs> so, but that's an unreasonable expectation because this is not a kick your heels in delight kind of book. Um, this is the third in a trilogy, so I can't tell you too much. I'll just say that this is sort of like an urban fantasy set in sort of a Asian inspired world where there's magical jade. Basically, we're following these interconnected families of gangsters. I think, I think Pinky Blinders is often the comp for the vibe. So we'll see, I'm gonna keep going and I hope it still stays, you know, I can enjoy the plot enough that I'm not focused on the writing. So that's what I'm manifesting for this. Uh, I will say I'm very glad that I jumped pretty much straight into this from Jade War because I think I have a good momentum. So I think that's helping me. So I'm hopeful. Not going as well, but I was worried I was just gonna be like 20 pages into this and be like, no, I can't do this anymore. And that's not how I feel. So let's 
keep going. Oops, sorry, I knocked you over. Uh, we're gonna keep going and hope it just keeps getting better. Cause this is supposed to be, I've heard so many people say that the, the finale is like the best of the series. So I'm really hopeful that that is going to be my experience and that I can get into it more and more and more as the book goes on. Guys, I really did try on this one. <laughs> I really tried, but I'm at page 166. And when I think about having to keep going, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. That's the long and the short of it. And okay, so I'm at a page 166 and I'm gonna DNF this. So I will now officially state for the record what my issue is. It is so much telling and not showing. Like we're talking pages and pages without dialogue. And I will say that I love her Untethered Sky novella and that style really worked in a novella to move through time. Like I thought that was great, but when it's like hundreds of pages of novel like that, I just can't anymore. Once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. There's more, I will say at the beginning of this, I felt like it was a little more broken up, but we're, I just, I can't. I cannot do this anymore. So it's, it's not bad. I think I would probably end up giving it the same three stars I gave Jade War. The ideas and what is happening is great, but the way it is being told, I am losing my will to live. So I've got to just DNF it. So, okay. I'm sorry, Liana, but you know, after your experience with Slave to Sensation, turnabout is fair play. So we're gonna move on. You should read this if you want a revenge plot line. A power trip story of a witch standing up against the sexist and puritan village that she has grown up in. Yes, the story isn't particularly groundbreaking or super complex, but it's just like fun. I feel like fun is a weird way to describe a horror novel, but I had fun. It really feels like you were there in this historical setting of a 17th century Puritan village where all of your neighbors watch your every move and judge them. Vividly descriptive and the magic in the book has this strong theme of reconnecting with nature which i really love and also really so we are off to a good start slewfoot by baram is horror which i was expecting yeah i'm really enjoying the writing so the setup for this is let's see it says an ancient spirit awakens in a dark wood the wild folk call him father slayer protector the colonists call him slewfoot demon devil to abatha a recently widowed outcast alone and vulnerable to her pious village he is the only one she can turn to for help well i just read okay so in this description it tells you that she's widowed she doesn't start widowed that's like early on in the book so there you go that's a thing that happens in this book. I'm not that far in this. So I guess it's not too egregious. I was so, that made me sad. I, so this is set in Puritan times and you know, Puritans are not the best, but I was into this pilgrim dude. He was super nice named Edward and then things happen and he dies. And Abatha is left in quite a pickle because he has this odious relative named Wallace who's trying to get the land out from under him. And if he can, if Abatha can't successfully raise crops on the land left to her by her late husband, the debt that's entailed with the land, she will have to like work off as an indentured servant. So basically being a slave to this odious asshat. Her and father have not yet collaborated, but I assume that's where it's going. Um, the writing is great. I'm really enjoying the actual writing. I think it's really well done. You know, anytime we have Puritans, I get, you know, a lot of feelings coming from a very religious background. <laughs> And like some of the conflict that inevitably comes up when the setting is a bunch of really religious Protestant people in the Americas. So it's sparking a lot of feelings for me, which I think is good. Uh, it's a credit to the book, but I'm really into this so far. It's got, you know, the stuff with father is like kind of gross. Like there's like wood, blood, sacrifice-y, primal, animal, whatever. And I think that's pretty cool. I'm into this. I'm excited to keep going. And so far I feel like off to a really 
strong start. Alrighty friends, it's been a couple days and I don't totally remember where we checked in on this, but I can tell you where we're leaving. I actually really enjoyed this. Uh, it is maybe a little less camp than I tend to like my horror, but I really liked the writing and that kind of sold me on it. So, it, you know, if you're looking for camp in your horror, I would not recommend this because it is very serious. But in my Goodreads view, I think what I said was I would pitch this as the Scarlet Letter meets Carrie, but then like with a bunch of forest pagan shit in it too. So it's very atmospheric. It is dealing a lot with religion, though in ways that I thought were more complex or layered than probably it could have, given that it's the literal Puritans and they're very easy to dunk on. <laughs> so I actually thought that was handled really nicely. I particularly liked um, the use of the reverend, the local pastor in this, in a way that I thought was very interesting. So yeah, the ending in particular I love. It gets very, in general there is a lot of like body horror slash just like extreme, ooh, how to say. It's taking what I would typically expect from a mystery thriller, you know, those kinds of violent scenes, and it's just cranked up quite a bit. So yeah, I mean I definitely think this qualifies as horror, and if you're into witchiness, pagan stuff, the devil, any of that, I definitely recommend this. I'd give this four stars. I think it, the, the plot is where I dock it. I think it kind of lagged a bit in the middle. Ooh, but I forgot to mention, I also encountered that there are these beautiful pictures. Like I loved this. This is Abatha, which I like. And this is Samson. So yeah, anyway, um, I thought it lagged a little bit in the middle, which is where I would dock it some points. But overall, I really like this. I would give it four stars and this, I'm really glad. Read something a little outside my comfort zone, but in a way that ended up being great for me. So yeah, this is a big success. A dark comedy. It's a lot of things. It's also a debut book and I found it to be wildly impressive for a debut. It's also a kind of absurd book because in it you're following a character who works in hell. He literally works in hell. His name is Peyote and his job is to get people to sign their souls over to then come to hell once they die. And he has collected a good amount of souls, especially from this rich family on earth named the Harrison family. And he is on the cusp of getting a promotion. He just has to get one more member of the Harrison family to sell their soul over to him. And in the story, you're following his journey, trying to do that along with his friend and coworker Calamity. And then you're also following the Harrison family on earth and uncovering all of their family dramas and secrets and things that they have going on between them as well. I just had so much fun with this. I thought the cure. Hello friends. I have not done a very good job keeping you updated because life, life is life. And I have finished another book and I'm partway through another one. So we're more than halfway through, which is exciting. Sign Here by Claudia Lux is the book that I have finished. This one, I have such mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I don't know that I've read a book quite like it. You know, it's a, it does feel like a distinct flavor, which I think is really commendable. It's a debut and it feels fresh. The synopsis pitches it as darkly funny workplace comedy in hell. <laughs> and um, that definitely is a good chunk of, or I mean, that that's an element of the book, but it definitely has other POVs uh, with the family that the main character is trying to get one more soul from. And I felt like that I was just not as interested in. Like, I really wish this entire book had been that dark place comedy in hell. I really enjoyed that part. And there's a lot of interesting ideas. Like, I'm trying really hard not to spoil this. <laughs> there's a lot of interesting ideas. It goes some interesting places. And the way it all comes together, I think, is very ambitious. I just don't know that it was fully successful to me. Like, I felt like the author had like a lot of things she was trying to hold together and she was like really trying to hold it together and I just don't know that it ever happened. Like I think things kind of went off the rails a little bit. Not in a wholly unsuccessful way, but just like I don't know that this landed for me fully. This didn't stick the landing. So I would not call this horror. I don't know what I would call this. You know, I also wonder if this suffers somewhat for me having recently read Good Omens, which is a great book involving Dean demons and like very funny. So maybe also this just suffers from timing in terms of me having read a similar and what I would say better book 
in some respects recently. I don't know. Anyway, I'm gonna give this three. I think it's fine. And I think it is definitely an impressive debut. I would certainly read more from the author because it clearly has a lot of interesting ideas. I would read more from the author. I don't know that this one fully worked for me, but I'm glad I gave it a try. So yeah, four books in were like, we've got two pretty good big hits, one so-so and one DNF. And then I'm partway through Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit. So this is another book that definitely has a lot of kind of political content, if you like, in it. Um, a book that that feels like it has a message and a, and a message that's conveyed really well. And, and I think more importantly than that, for me, it's a book that I've not stopped thinking about since I finished reading it. Um, I thought it was a really effective um, like message type book, but also a really, really effective and chilling horror novel. Um, so that book is Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumford, which I'm calling my favourite horror novel that I've read this year. So this is a book um, about two women, uh, one of whom is cisgender, one of whom is transgender, um, who were friends who've gone through a really traumatic experience in this creepy haunted house. And that has fractured their friendship and left a lasting impression on both of them. Um, and the book is about them kind of trying to move on with their lives, but also about the, the, the shadow that this event has, has cast over them. And this, I think, is on track to be another hit. I really like the writing in this. It's a horror novel. It's going to end up being a haunted house story. For now, it's just sort of like gritty general fiction realism, and that is pretty intense. I'm going to read you like content warning that the author included, because I think that it's important context for you to have, which is Tell Me I'm Worthless is a book about is about two things primarily, and those things are trauma and fascism. I thought it important to include a content warning here at the start to say that. In dealing with these topics, the novel covers racism, anti-Semitism, transphobia, rape both in abstract and graphic ways, self-harm and suicide. So just so you know what you're getting into, Alison Rumsfeld wants to give that kind of caveat, which I think makes sense, because this is very intense. I'm only, not only, I'm probably about a third of the way through, and we've already hit a lot of those notes. Yeah, Alice is our main POV character, I think. There's also other POVs, Illa and the house, the haunted house in question, that I've encountered at least so far. That's who has POVs, and sorry, my battery crapped out, and I don't totally remember what I was saying, but yeah, so overall, I, I would say so far, my impression is I really like the writing it's almost stream of consciousness but not quite like you can you can follow what's going on but it definitely has that kind of flowing non-linear type quality to it in some ways I mean I believe Alison Rumsfeld is a trans woman so that I think is an important context in terms of some of the things we see depicted because it's a lot so it's definitely not a light book but it is one that I am very much enjoying so far. It's been a couple days and I finished a book and started another one. So I did go ahead and finish Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit. Whew, this book is not for the faint of heart, but it's really good, I think. I... <sighs> I struggle to even know how to talk about this. The co I'm really glad I read, I believe I read you guys the content warning and I'm glad I did because I think things covered in that content warning are probably about as much as I want to say about like plot details because there's just a lot of heavy stuff that happens in this and this is unlike any other haunted house story I've ever read. I think there's some really interesting, pretty on the nose, but I liked it, so that was fine. Commentary about sexual assault and narratives around it and what trauma can do to radicalize people. Yeah, I don't know. This is a really heavy book, um, and I would not, if this was, ha if I did not know this was written by a trans woman, I think I would have liked it a lot less because some of the kind of like language and internalized transphobia in here is really hard to read. It actually reminded me a lot of two contrapoints videos, the one about cringe and the one about shame, in that she reflects on those as a part of her experience as a trans woman and some internalized transphobia she has. And that's something that's definitely explored in here. And I think if I didn't know that was coming from like a personal place, it would be harder for me to get through. Anyway, this is really a difficult read, but I found it to be very worthwhile and very challenging to have a chance to kind of experience that headspace. So definitely make sure if you're going to read 
read this, you pick a moment that is appropriate to read it. Uh, but I actually, I quite liked it. I would say on like the plot level, like I have critiques of this, so I would say four stars, but I really enjoyed this and I'm really, really glad that Ali pushed me to pick it up originally and then it making his list made me actually go ahead and read it. So yeah, I've seen this. I know he's he was my tipping point to get it, but I also had seen it a lot on the bookish internet writ large. So yeah, like I said, maybe pick your moment when it makes sense to read this and and I would definitely say it's very like heavy on its metaphor, like that is thing it's doing. So if you don't like that in horror, this might not be for you. But otherwise, yeah, I'm really very glad I read this. On a complete opposite end of the spectrum, in terms of genre and types of queer experiences represented, uh, I'm gonna say that I picked up The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes by Kat Sebastian. So the thing with Cat Sebastian is that it's all historical romance, but like everybody's a little bit queer, which is, you know, it's fine for this world. It's kind of interesting seeing like the past with queer characters that are so outwardly queer. So I appreciate that for Cat Sebastian because that's like across all of their works. And this book in particular is basically the epitome of uh, be, buy, do crime. <laughs> so it's just basically they're getting into capers, doing crimes, saving the day, and also, um, you know, defying gender roles. This is sort of like a Robin and Marion uh, retelling idea. It's about Marion who kills her husband and then gets sort of blackmailed into working with this guy Rob. Plot? What plot? Uh, it's just about shenanigans and fluff. It's really fucking cute. They do some crimes together and the sex scenes in this are actually good. These are two bisexual best people. I just am obsessed with these two. I I want to reread it just to hang out with them again. And I just, I have to tell you so far, this book is such a delight and a really good palate cleanse to something <clears throat> so heavy and intense. Um, this, I'm not very far into it, but I'm already obsessed. It has all these letters at the beginning. The setup is kind of wacky because dude is a criminal who knows that he should be the heir to this duke and that the duke's marriages to these two other women are invalid because he was originally married to his mom kind of like functionally separated so he just went on to marry someone else and had a kid with her and that was not a legitimate marriage because his mom's still alive and he never divorced her so he's writing to now ostensibly the second wife of this duke who's actually his third wife and trying to blackmail her um and i believe she's gonna kill this duke <laughs> based on the back of the of the book so I am way into this. The, the writing and tone and characters and banter is just great so far. And this is such a good palate cleanse. Very excited to keep going in this because it is exactly what I needed. Hello, my friends. We are having a very low energy day here in the Lyco household. Yeah, it's a gross rainy day. It's going to be a gross rainy weekend. I've got very low spoons on the autoimmune-ness of it all. So, um, I've been doing some reading and browsing on Ravelry for patterns, which I don't really need to do because I already have a full list of things I'm trying to make. Anyway, did I finish The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes by Kat Sebastian? Yes, in fact, I did this morning. It was just so fun. So cute. Considering it's murder, that's a weird adjective, but it's like just very bantery and jolly japes. And Rob and Marion, they have great chemistry. You know, it's lots of hijinks. I found it very funny. The, you know, smut scenes were smutting. Yeah, it's just really good historical romance. So the Be Gay Do Crimes is accurate for this one. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't I feel like I have a lot of interesting things to say other than this was exactly what I needed today. So four stars here. And I've moved on to a book. It's taking me longer to read. Also, I'm petting Marple because she's being all snuggly and purring and stuff. Oh, my sweet baby. A book that is taking me longer to read, but that I'm very much enjoying. The reason it's taking me longer is because I have to concentrate. And that is Leech by Huron Inez fiction book. In it, we're following a nameless, genderless doctor who is part of this 
hive mind collective consciousness, collective knowledge base. And the doctor who came before them working at this chateau has recently passed. So they are here to take over to help people and also look into this parasite that took the old doctor's life. It's an intentionally confusing book, which made the reread a real treat to get back to. There's a lot of medical jargon and body horror. It was about the colonization of bodies and minds as well as land, who is in power, who has control, who makes decisions over resources. I tabbed so many really amazing quotes and scenes. So I'm not gonna hold this up because I wanna keep petting Marple. <laughs> But um, so this book is really interesting. It It's doing something that I've talked about before that I love, which is um, purposeful disorientation. I think that's something that's really hard to do well. And I believe this is a debut and I'm so impressed with how well... Oh, okay, she's gone. Um, I'm really impressed with how well um, they are pulling this off in this book. It definitely drops you in and you kind of have to figure out what's going on. So this doctor shows up to this estate in a far northern climb in this like wintry empire. And pretty quickly we infer that this doctor is basically a part of a hive mind referred to as the Institute. So they are a part, like all these different doctors in the Institute are all like just extensions of the hive mind, which is always an interesting thing um, when authors try to write that. And I think this one's pretty effective. They're, the new doctor is there because the old doctor died seemingly by their own hand in this like really weird way with this like parasite thing. I don't know. It's There's a lot going on and I'm having to focus, which is a little hard for me to do today because I don't have a lot of spoons, but it is well worth the focus so far because I'm just really into the writing, I'm into the world, I'm into the vibe, the kind of kind of mystery horror thing that this seems to be doing. There's already some body horror. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really into this so far. So I think I'm gonna take a break and go do some knitting. But hopefully I'll either finish this today or tomorrow, because tomorrow's gonna be a gross rainy day too. So I was supposed to do some yard work and I guess this is my excuse to not do that <laughs> and to read instead. Alrighty, so I finished a book and started another. I finished Leech by Huron Inez and this is so good. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I totally understood it. I, this is a book I think would I would benefit from doing a reread on because I think like, I believe I was telling you guys this when I was first getting into it it does have a lot of purposeful disorientation. And to me, that's something that is really hard for an author to pull off. And when it does work, it's something I love. And for me, this really worked. You know, there's enough kind of like handholds for me to get what's going on. I will say in contrast to, uh, what was a, that book that I recently read? Oh, oh, it was in this video. <laughs> Um, Sign Here, which was also a debut that I thought was really inventive. That was one where I felt like there's a lot going on and you're really trying to hold it together and it just doesn't quite. And for me, this one mostly like was held together with all of the different complexities that the author introduced. And considering both of those are debuts, I think they're both impressive, but this especially so, because I felt like this was very impressive. I would describe this as mystery horror, and there is a lot of body horror in this. If that is something that is going to bother you, um, just know that. But yeah, it's like a country house mystery, sci-fi, body horror extravaganza. And I was really into this. So I'm going to give this four and a half stars. I think this is one of my favorite things I've read this year. I guess like in contrast to Sword Heart, where it's like, oh, this is one of my favorites because of my like feelings. This is one of my favorites because of the way it was getting in my head and making me getting in my head is kind of a funny thing, given what's going on in this. Um, but <laughs> the way it was making me think and like, it felt like it was a puzzle in and of itself, aside from the mystery, which I just really enjoyed. Um, so I would, I would definitely say this is more horror than mystery, but it has the bones of a country house mystery. And that was just a lot of things I like. So yeah, I really like this. I thought this was very impressive. Moving on to our final book and by far our most controversial book because this was on many people's worst and many people's best of the year. That is Yellowface by R.F. Kuang. So this 
This is about a white woman. And when I say this is about a white woman, honestly, that's really all I need to say. And she's an author, but she is not at the level in which she thinks that she deserves. And she believes it's because she's white. Now, she has a friend. Sure, Jan. Friend. Um, who is an Asian author and is very well off and is very well treated. Uh, she thinks in the publishing industry. While this was not my favorite favorite, it's left an impression on me because it's Rebecca, duh. But like, June, I just, it just, it just hit, it just was so, you know, it just felt so, yeah, realistic. That would happen. That's probably happened. I believe it. I hate June so much. I don't know what else to say besides I hate June so much. Um, this was one of my, this is not only one of my most popular reviews on Goodreads for 2023. It's one of my most popular reviews of all time on Goodreads. Yellow Face is is a very polarizing book. There are people who really, really love Yellow Face like me and people who really, really hate Yellow Face. And I think it was kind of like the irony of Yellow Face that just made me like enjoy it. I think a lot of people went in expecting to like characters, but when I wrote my review, I was saying like, y'all want characters to behave in certain ways because you've been conditioned to believe especially when we're talking about Asian women you have certain expectations based on your unconscious bias of how Asian women should perform how they should behave and then you have a white woman in publishing who does what people in publishing do all the time which with all the publishing scandals that we had at the end of December I'm like Y'all, this is what she's talking about. I think about it. And God, I hated you. Wow, being in her head was wild. And so I wasn't, I went into this really not sure what was going to happen because it has been so divisive. But guess what, guys? It turns out Rebecca can do no wrong for me. I just love her writing. I love her point of view. I love the way she does characters and the way she has... It's like her themes are on the nose, but they're on the nose in such a purposeful way that it works for me. I can't explain why, because in other authors I would criticize it, but for me it just works, so I just love it, <laughs> and I'm really into this. Also, this is the fastest read. I think I'm at page like 80-ish, 77, and I've only been reading for like maybe 40 minutes. It's just flying by. It's such a fast read. It's a page turner. For me, at least, like I'm so into this. And this reminds me, I read, oh gosh, what was that one? <sighs> I could see the cover. Jean Honfs, I think. I'll put it here, that book. But it's the same kind of premise of somebody stealing a genius work from another writer when that other writer dies. But this one has the added layers of cultural appropriation and white lady BS, I say as a white lady. This is, it's so interesting because a lot of the critiques I heard was, oh, June is just so like cartoonishly bad and it's just so on the nose. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll get further in, but so far I'm like, June, totally reads like a non-thoughtful, very privileged white lady. <laughs> like the math checks out so far to me. She doesn't seem like cartoonishly bad. She just seems like she's very entitled and just not conscious of that at all. Um, so I don't know, I'm loving this so far. We'll see if it takes a turn. Um, and maybe it's that it just gets repetitive because a lot has happened and I kind of don't know where it's gonna go from here. So I'm interested to see what all else gets introduced into the text. Um, but yeah, I'm way into this so far. So, so far I'm definitely falling on the side of loving it. Okay guys, I think we're officially done. So, yellow face. I love this. I see some of the critiques, but I guess it just doesn't resonate with me because 
For me, this was page turning. It was, yes, it was on the nose, I guess, in terms of the critiques it was making, but I thought those critiques were interesting, incisive, correct. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, okay. And I thought that it, it layered in some different elements with social media in a way that I, was interesting to me as a creator. Like, yeah, I could see, I could see why if you're not toxically online, maybe this would be less appealing to you. But I just thought this was great. And I thought June was a monster, but like a very believable one. Uh, one that I recognize in others and need to guard against in myself. Riffing on that, this isn't directly what this book is about, but what it was making me think about was uh, an emerging sociological concept that me and my best friend were talking about because she's a psychologist and she does assessments. Sort of the TikTokification of people self-diagnosing themselves with various things. And something that, and that's been very frustrating and like difficult for her in her practice because people don't want to hear like, hey, you have depression. You you don't have whatever you think you have based on TikTok, like this is what you have. And it's less, it's less narratively satisfying for them sometimes in terms of how they're conceptualizing things that they're going through in their life. And part of what is feeding into that is this emerging idea of the race to the margins. And this is something particularly that white women are doing where they are identifying and trying to kind of like intensify their identification with the marginal identities that they do have, particularly around things like ADHD and autism and queerness, etc. Because they see that as having some social cachet that they can't get just by virtue of being white women. The iron part of what we were talking about and the irony of that is like, oh, wow, so your own internalized like glorification of white men is such that you can't even acknowledge the way that you genuinely do experience marginalization <laughs> as a woman and you instead have to like build an identity around a different marginalization that you either really do have or at least like conceptualize yourself as having. Anyway, so that was part of what this was making me think of. <laughs> this is not directly what this book was about, but it was just making me think of like as white women, like, I don't know, I mean, to my fellow white women, like the level of self-honesty and self-interrogation that our privilege requires us to have is something that it is difficult to do. And I am very appreciative of voices in my life that can check me when I'm not as aware of that and not doing that work. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> this book uh, I thought was just really interesting and thought provoking. And it's a re I hate that it has the the Reese's book club thing on here. But I can see why it would be a book club pick because I do think that there's a lot to talk about in this even if people didn't end up liking it. So um, also side note, the uh, the author that June steals from her name is Athena Liu. And right when I was reading this, I got served a video from YouTube of a knitting channel where the knitter, knitter's name is Athena Liu. So alternative world, Athena lives on as a knitter in Vancouver. I, that, I love that as a alternative timeline reading of this. So anyway, um, I'm not sure if any of that made sense, but I did enjoy this and I would give it four and a half stars. <laughs> I thought that this was really thought provoking and very page turning. And I think this is the book where I'm going to officially say that R.F. Kuang is one of my favorite writers because I have loved, I've never given her anything less than a four star. And I have loved standalone fantasy, general fiction, and a series fantasy from her. So I've read five books. I've really enjoyed all of them. And I just love, there's there's something about the way she does her character work that I completely understand other people don't like. But for me, it reads as kind of almost Dickensian. I don't know, there's something about her writing in combination with how she does it that just really works for me. Um, and clearly a lot of other people, she's very popular, but I get that it's not for everyone. But I just really love the way she writes I love the way she writes a book. I like her books. They're good. So um, yeah, anyway, four and a half stars here. So where does that leave us with these eight books? I think we have three distinct groupings here. So I'm gonna have my bottom two are the two that I am glad I read or attempted to read, but were not huge successes. Uh, the first being, Jade Legacy. I know, I'm really sorry, guys. But the bottom line is I didn't see it in Jade City. I started to see it in Jade War. And then realizing that this is a nearly, this is like a 750 page book. I just didn't want a full book of it. 
so I think I need to go look up a synopsis of the plot summary so that I can know what happens, but I just don't think that the experience of reading this full book is for me. And I will say that the writing thing I noticed that bothers me in this book is part of what I thought made the novella I read from Fonda Lee so successful. So I think maybe my answer is, yeah, so I think I just need to keep looking out for more shorter works from Fonda Lee because that, I think the writing issue I have works very well in a shorter book, but in a longer one, it becomes a problem. Hopefully I have been vague enough that I have not spoiled this or ruined things. I'm so sorry. I know people love this and I validate your love for this. And then sign here. I'm actually so glad that this video pushed me to read this because I thought this was a very interesting book. I just felt like it had too, it didn't, I don't think that it fully came together. Like I don't think the ingredients fully incorporated into the batter of this book. Hopefully that analogy made sense. I was making it up as I went. But I think that this is worth trying and I would definitely try more from this author because I think they're, the humor in this really worked for me and um, there were ideas in this that I thought were very interesting. So I would be curious to have more from this author but this particular book I just didn't feel like fully came together the way that I was hoping to in a way that worked for me. I'm, I'm holding on to the rest of these books, guys, because I liked everything else. So my four star tranche, I had three four stars. Um, and I probably like them all about the same. Like, I think these are all strong four stars. So Slufa, let's talk about the two horror because I think that these were very, you know, obviously, I'd self selected to read them because I already had them. <laughs> but um, I'm also glad this pushed me to go ahead and pick them up. And I'm glad that I was interested in them in the first place, because I think that they helped expand some of my understanding of my own tastes in horror and pushed me a little bit on some of like out of my comfort zone, I guess a little bit in horror, because I'd say my main comfort zone in horror is something a little campier or a little more mystery driven. Maybe uh, these were more body horror forward and more theme forward which I do enjoy but some I like they, they're very serious books that's not necessarily like my comfort zone in horror I think so I just you know these were good opportunities to push myself a little bit this one I really like that it's, it's handling of religion yeah the imagery in this is like a lot but it I mean clearly in a purposeful way it's horror and in ways that I thought were interesting and the ending. Yeah, I don't know. This one, this one was really, it was a thinker. Um, I wonder if I would have, I think I would have given this five stars if it had been a novella. Because there was a lot of good stuff in here. Um, but I just felt pacing wise, it was a little bit off for my taste. But yeah, anyway, I'm very glad I picked this up. Uh, I would definitely read more from this author. This was as good as everybody was saying it was the year it came out. I remember this was a big book. It was my most uncomfortable read of the month or for this project and because it's just very much encapsulating and putting you in the headspace of as the uh, the content warning at the beginning of it said uh, trauma and fascism. <laughs> so it's just a lot and it's an experience that's different from my own but I also could relate to it in certain ways that were thought provoking and reflective for me. Um, I really enjoyed some of the plays with the form that it did. There's this one scene, I'm trying to think of if I can talk about this without spoiling. Let's just say that there's a scene where there are side by side columns of text and it is the simultaneous experience of the same scene from two points of view. And I think that was a very compelling and, and well done scene like that's something that will stick with me from this book again not a little outside my comfort zone for what i tend to like in horror but very metaphor forward which is something i really connect with and um yeah like i said very uncomfortable but in a good like edifying way and then the exact opposite in tone <laughs> but another very four strong four star was the perfect crimes of marion hayes i'm gonna go back and read the first book in this series i will say um I had to kind of do some in between the line reading because clearly it was alluding to some events that had happened in the first book. So note that but um, I was able to figure it out. And I just the the banter in this was absolutely delightful. I thought that it's ex exploration of each of their sexuality was really interesting in this time period and also just like for them as people. Um, it was funny. It was action packed. 
great characters. Like this was just fun. I, I just had a good time in this. So excited to get into Cat Sebastian a little bit more. I have been meaning to, to, I think I said this at the beginning. I've been, this was not a book that was on my TBR, but it was an author on my TBR. And I'd been looking for a book to get back into this author with and um, this was a great one. So I definitely will read more and I just thought this was so fun and a good palette cleanse in between some heavier books. And then my favorite books, let's put them in order. I would say these are all four and a half stars. So these are all favorite reads of the year. I'm gonna say number three is Leech, just because it didn't have that like emotional connection for me as much as Yellowface and Swordheart did. So that's probably because I have existing relationships with those authors, but this is so thought provoking and it's a mystery horror where the form of the book itself is a little bit of a puzzle which I think is really fun and very hard to pull off. For me this author did uh, again a lot of body horror and a lot of purposeful disorientation. Body horror it seems like I'm, I'm okay with now that I'm like <laughs> talking about this. Apparently I can get down with that uh, but I do really love purposeful disorientation so that really sold me and it's the isolation just this was just it was weird but in a way I loved. So I'd give this four and a half stars. Um, yellow face I just I just did my full spiel about this so you guys heard but yeah page turner really entertaining but also a lot to think about so I thought I fall on the side of loving this and thinking it's great. And then my favorite does have to be sword heart. Some of this is just it just made me happy and you know that's always gonna get extra bonus points. Something that I'm like oh this is just so nice and so fun. And it was cozy, but also like, I don't know. I just love this. This is just a, a me book. I love T. Kingfisher. And I cannot wait to dive into that Paladin series now that I've read this. So that is my top book. But yeah, overall, I think another very successful outing of BookTuber's favorites driving me to pick things for my TBR. I did it last year and had some of my best books of the year in it. And I did have three, four and a half stars coming out of this. So I think this seems like a pretty good combination. Books I'm already interested in, plus glowing endorsement equals a good reading time, it seems. So with that being said, a big thank you to literally every booktuber who made a best of the year list because I probably watched it. Uh, and specifically to the fine creators who inspired this particular video, I will have all of them linked in the description box. So go and check them out. There's some other books they so these are the ones I read that that I already had on my TBR. They definitely also influenced me to pick up new books. <laughs> so um, but so did many people at the every year I, I January is always a very heavy book buying month for me because I'm like, Ooh, so yeah, I think that will do it for now. Uh, so check out all of those creators and give them a like. And if you like this video, give it a like subscribe, hit the notification bell if you want to. Uh, I've got all my social media stuff linked below. And I think that'll do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day. And I will just talk to you soon. Bye.